Hello, everyone, and welcome to tonight's Women in Leadership Climate Summit. We are broadcasting tonight on Facebook Live and Twitter. I'm Elizabeth Houtman, the field organizer for Moms Clean Air Force Michigan Chapter, and I will be your moderator and host for tonight's event. Moms Clean Air Force is a nationwide movement of more than a million moms and dads, including nearly 40,000 here in Michigan, united to fight air pollution and the urgent crisis of our changing climate. In honor of Women's History Month, Moms Clean Air Force, along with our partners, the Green Door Initiative and the Sierra Club Michigan Chapter, have gathered four incredible climate leaders who are fighting in various capacities for clean air and climate action for our kids, frontline communities, and future generations. These women demonstrate leadership in climate action that will protect Michiganders' public health, the environment, and put us on a path towards a more sustainable and healthier planet for the sake of our children. We are looking forward to hearing from one of these amazing leaders, including Director Clark from the Michigan Department of Environment, Great Lakes and Energy, also known as EGLE, Congresswoman Haley Stevens, Dr. Cecilia Martinez from the White House Council on Environment Quality, and United States Senator Debbie Stabenow. Our first conversation will be with Director Lisa Clark, who leads the state agency tasked with protecting our air, water, and climate. Director Clark was also appointed by Governor Gretchen Whitmore in early 2019. During her tenure at Eagle, Director Clark has been a force to be reckoned with, overseeing 500 million budget that supports 1,200 person team dedicated to protecting Michigan's environment and public health. Director Clark has, among many accomplishments, has led a reorganization that has elevated Michigan's commitment to environmental justice, climate mitigation, and resilience, drinking water, and the Great Lakes. This recognition led to newly created Office of the Environmental Justice Public Advocate, Clean Water Public Advocate, and Climate and Energy. Welcome, Director Clark. Thank you for joining us today. And Thanks for starting us out with some of your remarks this morning. Sounds great. Thanks for the invitation. I do really appreciate the opportunity to talk with you and to communicate with all of your members. So we really appreciate the energy and enthusiasm that you all bring to your work. Um, I think that one of the things that we've been talking about a lot lately is the urgency around climate work. And I think I'd like to uh, kind of echo that as I uh, visit with you all here today. Um, we know that, you know, uh, movement is now and the urgency is now and people that are at the starting line are frankly behind the times. Um, so we're continuing to move forward from a state perspective and a couple of updates since the last time we talked. Um, the state has launched the Michigan Council on Climate Solutions. Um, so this is an opportunity to interact and we invite all of you to participate and interact too. Uh, Michigan.gov uh, slash climate is the place to check it out. We're coming up on our second meeting already um, and this work is going to happen quickly. There is a variety of work groups that support the effort uh, at the council and you know this conversation um, with you and all of your membership is such an important part of that work. So just wanted to make sure that that was on everyone's radar. Of course, this work complements the lead by example work that the state's been doing as well. But we know that it's important not only for state action, but also then uh, to support and accelerate what's happening in the private sector and what's happening really on the ground with local communities. So we're pretty excited and animated and uh, again, sense that urgency. And so we're thrilled to partner with you and your members on um, moving this agenda forward. You know, moms are really excited to learn about the new Flip the Fleet program here in Michigan that reaffirms Michigan's commitment to carbon neutrality by incentivizing small businesses and school districts to switch from high emission producing diesel to electric fleets. Moms are especially see the benefit to children who ride diesel school buses to and from school every day. Can you tell us a little bit more about this program? I mean, how many of us remember standing in the exhaust as the buses were lined up and we were waiting uh, to get on our school bus? So I'm very excited about this program as a complement to our um, electric uh, school bus program where we've already deployed uh, across the state um, uh, electric school buses in partnership with the local utilities. 
um, to really not only see that air quality benefit for um, our students, which is so critical as you correctly point out, but then also understand what does that uh, electric school bus mean uh, to the local distribution grid and how can um, the local utilities take advantage of having that storage capacity um, on their grid. So some really exciting um, action that happens from these programs uh, that not only moves forward the air quality work, um, but also uh, helps us think about that grid of the future. Um, we all know that uh, in Michigan, especially climate solutions are mobility solutions and mobility solutions are climate solutions. And so we have to have this comprehensive view and you know, the flip your fleet program, the electric school buses program, um, other pieces around electric vehicle charging infrastructure is so important to make sure that we're um, moving all of that agenda forward together. I agree, air quality is one of those issues that moms are very concerned about. And in your role as director of Eagle, how do you see the environment, Great Lakes and Energy, advancing solutions to our 15 cities with an F grade and six more cities with a D grade from the American Lung Association State of the Air Report? Well, we see a lot of progress around air quality in Michigan, and we know that um, the numbers have just continued to improve and that trend is phenomenal, but there's still more work to do. And there's probably always gonna be more work to do, but particularly as um, identified by this report, um, and we also know that um, we can talk about these things at a state level, at a national level, at a, at a global level, but the work is really local. And so that's why, you know, we're working really hard to partner with communities and to um, meet communities where they're at as we're working on advancing problems like this. Um, so, you know, one example of uh, work that we've been doing to meet communities where they're at is through our environmental justice public advocate, working closely with Regina Strong, and the creation of the Michigan Advisory Council on Environmental Justice. And that um, group has been meeting for well over a year now, um, talking and um, understanding steps and policies um, that the department's taking and helping us look at it with a different lens. Uh, uh, we've spent a lot of time, in fact, with the Mackey J talking about um, air emissions tracking and where can we uh, push things for further forward on air emissions tracking. So this is really important work because we know you translate these numbers and these scorecards into the health of our kids and the health of our families. And so um, it's important that we see, you know, the real people behind these numbers. Well, yeah, and, and community is a big part of that. And speaking of which, how can the community and our members, our other organizations, those listening today, what are ways that they can get more involved and help push along Eagle's agenda to clean up and help with the environment here in Michigan? So there's many ways to get involved, just a couple to highlight. Um, the first is that um, any support uh, from a funding perspective, particularly in a budget year where we've got fees in front of the legislature, is always appreciated. Um, and we've got a few fees up this year. Um, we are also working hard to push forward the My Clean Water Plan in a different um, world than um, the air discussion we've been having but it's all connected, that system is all connected and making sure that we're doing everything we can to provide people with safe, clean drinking water um, is an important part of our work. And so support for that is greatly appreciated. From a climate perspective, we have a few different programs. So going to michigan.gov slash climate is a great way to get involved. We record um, pretty much all of our meetings. And so if you're not able to attend at a particular time, you can always go back and watch. Um, we take a variety of public comment on things. Um, and another thing to think about is um, the catalyst communities work. The work that happens on the ground makes, as I mentioned before, all the other variables work. We've got to, everything is local. We've got to be having these local conversations. And then finally, there's pieces that you can see on our website, michigan.gov slash E-G-L-E, Eagle. You can go see our calendar. So for example, we've got a session coming up here just in the next couple of weeks about citing wind and solar in local communities. And so those are places that your membership might be interested in understanding how to get involved and how to continue the momentum. Well, I just wanna say at this time, thank you so much for meeting with us, our members and our greater organization here. Um, we're always happy to have you on and 
get more information about what's going on here in the state level. So thank you very much for meeting with us today. Glad to do it. I really appreciate the invitation. Appreciate the work that you're doing. Same here. Thank you. Thank you so much for speaking with us today, Director. Moms are ready to support you and the work you are doing to protect our air, water, and climate. And now, I'm excited to introduce our next panelist, Congresswoman Haley Stevens, who has represented Michigan 11th District since January of 2019. Congresswoman Stevens grew up in Rochester Hills, Michigan, and graduated from Seaholm High School. She earned her bachelor's and master's degrees from the American University before becoming elected to Congress. Representative Stevens served as Chief of Staff to the U.S. Auto Rescue Task Force, the federal initiative responsible for saving General Motors, Chrysler, and over 200,000 jobs here in Michigan. She's also played a key role in setting up the Office of Recovery of Automotive Communities and Workers and the White House Office of Man Manufacturing Policy. In Congress, she sits on the House Committee on Education, Labor, and the House Committees of Science, Space, and Technology, where she also serves as chairwoman of the Research and Technology Subcommittees. Welcome, Congresswoman. Thank you for joining us today. Well, thank you so much, Elizabeth, and thank you to the entire Moms Clean Air Force. You all do such great work, and I love working alongside you. And Elizabeth is spot on. These are passion topics for me. I am incredibly engaged as a member of the House Science Committee, focused on our climate change challenges, as well as an engaged member of the House Education and Labor Committee, uh, particularly focused on kids and the needs of our kids in schools. But more broadly, as a member of Congress, my uh, framing on this comes from the infrastructure guarantee that everyone's allowed to ride on, you know, uh, safe to maintain roadways and bridges and not live in neighborhoods where dams are going to break and that we all have the right to drink fresh water and breathe fresh, clean air. And we are in a, you know, post, uh, you know, uh, industrial revolution society, post post industrial revolution society, meaning that our industrial environment has been in place for a long time. I work really closely with a lot of manufacturers and know that they also want to make sure that everyone has clean air to breathe. And so by prioritizing these guarantees, we can continue to innovate and make change and progress our society forward. So that's what I'm working on every day in Congress. And I am really, really pleased to do so alongside such great partners like all of you at Moms. Well, thank you for that. And moving into my first question, which relates to all the work you've been doing around plastics. You just recently had a town hall about plastic waste solutions and job creation tackling this issue. Can you tell us more about your work around plastic waste and recycling? Yeah, this is a, a great passion topic of mine in particular because the United States has gone very under and invested in terms of our recycling infrastructure. And we're only recycling about 9% of the plastics out there. And we could do a lot better. We could support our communities, our neighborhoods, and obviously all of our families a, a lot a lot better at, through the use of uh, recycling applications and technologies and in particular my legislation the plastic waste reduction uh, and recycling act that i introduced with a colleague of mine from ohio is a great first start of coordinating a whole of government approach uh, making sure that the u.s uh, industry in advanced plastics recycling technologies is unleashed unleashing some of the innovative innovative applications as well as working with our uh, environmental protection agency to ensure that we've got an all of government approach that we're you know utilizing um, uh, the pilot initiatives and resources before us and then tied into that Elizabeth I also introduced a uh, plastic solution task force it's a bipartisan task force with um, our uh, a host of stakeholders from the nonprofit private sector and, and on community that come together to kind of help us 
uh, identify what's happening in the field, what some of the needs are, uh, and and the like. So I'm really pleased to have introduced that task force. I've got a leading role on the recycling caucus, which the task force is a part of. We're going to be reintroducing the the bill that I just mentioned, the Plastics Waste Reduction uh, and Recycling Act later this year. And I'll just lastly say that. Um, last session of Congress two years ago, I convened uh, the, the first science hearing on recycling in a decade, and we learned so much. And so we've taken from that hearing and really run run with it to lead to this task force as well as the legislation. And, you know, it's all about supporting our circular economy. It's all about getting in front of the waste that pollutes and doesn't disintegrate and goes on and on and on. So, yeah. Well, thank you for your work on that. And going back to your opening remarks, as the chairwoman on the Science, Space, and Technology Committee, in that position, can you discuss your priorities to address the climate crisis in that leadership role? Yeah, absolutely, because they're, they are uh, enormous. And one of the big priorities that we have uh, as a country that just very proudly uh, rejoined the Paris Climate Accord is that we need to reduce those CO2 carbon emissions. Uh, and we need to look towards alternative energies uh, in particular. We're in Michigan, as you know, Elizabeth, and we are focusing on electric vehicles. We're focusing on alternative energies energies. We're taking a cross-cutting approach to get really serious about lowering the emissions uh, and getting us to a place where we are completely decreasing the upward tick of carbon emissions that is depleting our ozone, leading to these stream weather events, leading to, you know, uh, the lack of clean air. You know, we're starting now to even think about what happens if we live in a world without ice. Uh, which is incredibly dangerous to consider and is is a huge threat to us. So we're in the middle still of living through this pandemic. We know it's really hard uh, and it has challenged society in ways that we never thought possible. And that is in many ways something that we are seeing with, with climate change as well. And thank you for that. I appreciate that. And I'm just going to ask the question I've been asking everybody, and, and that is how can the community and our members and our organizations and those listening support the work around climate in Congress? What are some ways we can get more involved? Well, there's a ton. And one I'd really like to recommend as while we're doing virtual hearings, I'd really love for you guys to participate in the hearings. You know, there's not a lot of chance to raise questions, but I just think listening to what's taking place in Congress. We just had a climate change hearing on the Science Committee. You can go back online and, and listen to it. And this is something that all members of Congress really need to do a good job of is, is hearing each other and then saying, wait a minute, so-and-so was saying something that I've been thinking and maybe this is a chance to work together or you know what so and so and I aren't on the same page but maybe I can find a way to educate them or connect them to the Moms Clean Air Force. You know, maybe they haven't had that chance to have that meeting yet. So I do think the hearings are a great springboard. I think you guys do a great job and keep at it, asking for these meetings with your member of Congress. You know, we all can't, Elizabeth, you and I know this, and this is why I was so excited to be with you all today, is we can't spend enough time together, right? We are connected. We are united in this effort. And it's very real when it's people in your community sitting down with you and then also don't be shy about the bills that have captured your attention that you're endorsing and that you're supporting and that you want to see us take on because I think that that is is also something that I know for me has a, a, a good a very strong and good impact in terms of how I do my job so I just want to thank you all I think you're best in business well thank you so much for your time today your remarks and being a leader on climate, I really appreciate it. Let's get it done. I Let's appreciate do this. You. Thank you so much. All right. Have a great rest of the day. Bye-bye. Yeah, you too. Thanks again. Bye. Congresswoman, thank you so much for spending time with us today. We count ourselves so lucky to have you standing up for the health and the future of our kids and representing Michiganders so well in Washington, D.C. Next up, I have the honor of introducing two panelists. For our next conversation, Danielle Wilkins, founder of CEO of the Green Door Initiative, and Dr. Cecilia Martinez, 
Senior Director of the Environmental Justice at the Council of Environmental Quality. Janelle Wilkins has dedicated her life work to improving the quality of life for Detroiters and others through environmental and social justice. She is the founder and director of the Green Door Initiative, a nonprofit organization promoting environmental justice in Michigan. Danelle has played a key role in developing Michigan's environmental justice policy, launched in the city's first green jobs training programs, advocated for citizens' involvement in public policy, citizen science, and contributed to many scholarly articles on environmental justice and public health. Ms. Wilkins is also serves as Detroit City Council's appointee to the Detroit Brownfield Redevelopment Authority, served on the Environmental Protection Agency National Environmental Justice Advocacy Council, and served as Governor Granholm's appointee to Michigan's Department of Environmental Quality Advisory Council. Joining her in the conversation this evening is Dr. Cecilia Martinez, Senior Director of the Environmental Justice at the Council for Environmental Quality. In this role, Dr. Martinez will be facilitating and coordination of the whole of government environmental justice agenda of the Biden administration. Previously, she was the executive director of the Center of Earth, Energy and Democracy. Dr. Martinez also previously held positions as the associate research professor in the College of Earth, Ocean and Environment at the University of Delaware. She has led a variety of projects to address sustainable development at the local, state, and federal level. Her work focuses on the development of energy and environmental strategies that promote equability and sustainable policies. She has received her BS from Stanford University and an MPA from the New Mexico State University and her PhD from the University of Delaware's College of Urban Affairs and Public Policy. Welcome ladies to the program. Thank you so much for joining us today. So, so Dr. Cecilia Martinez, trailblazer, activist, academic, uh, just an EJ spokesperson and advocate. Now you're playing another role. Why don't you tell for our listening audience, describe what it means needs to be with the council, the White House Council for Environmental Quality. What is that division, that department? What is your role? Well, thank you, Danielle. First of all, can I just say that when you said historic, I want to just emphasize historic in the sense that um, so many EJ community members, so many activists, so many trailblazers, so many folks who have been working on on justice for um, and a healthy environment for all our communities. Um, that this moment in elevating environmental justice to the White House level is really on been a result of all their hard work. And I know many of uh, many of the folks who have been active in the movement, who have been leaders in the movement, are no longer with us. And I just want to pay tribute. Um, to all of them, because this wouldn't be, we wouldn't be here today without their passion, commitment, dedication, and all the hard work that they put in to get us here. Um, and so it is, it is, the moment is built on the backs of all the people who have been working towards this moment. It is a moment where for the first time, environmental justice in, is in a White House office in the Council of Environmental Quality where um, where we have an administration that is identified a whole of government approach to environmental justice. And what that means is as important it has, it has been for EPA and continues to be for EPA to hold environmental justice um, in the agency and to push on environmental regulation and environmental sustainability programs through EPA, we also know that environmental justice has housing components, energy components, health components, agriculture and food components. It's a very, it's, it's environmental justice, as we know, the definition is where we live, work, play, pray, and learn. And so for that reason, we need a whole of government interagency approach to environmental justice. And that's my role. My role is to help facilitate that, to make sure it happens, 
and to make sure that the investments that move forward with the administration really do um, are prioritized for our vulnerable communities. Well, thank you for that. Uh, and I also, I, I'm with you on acknowledging those uh, shoulders that we stand on, the, those that have gone on to, uh, to be with the ancestors um, as well. So, um, Cecilia, what is your vision for your role? As this is an historic moment, um, the Biden administration certainly has done something that no other administration has done. How do you envision rolling this out? Mm -hmm. I think um, in, a, in a few ways. So first, <clears throat> one of the first things that you will see shortly, probably within the next month, is the establishment of a White House Environmental Justice Advisory Council. Again, a historic moment, the first time we will have EJ folks, EJ community members, EJ researchers, um, who will be advising the White House on this whole of government environmental justice approach. Um, I am thrilled you will see people who are elders in the movement, you will see younger people who are in the movement, you will see people from um, all walks of life across the country working on a, a whole variety of issues on environmental justice. And so that advisory council is going to be key because that's going to be our connector to the community, making sure that we are hearing and that we are accountable to environmental justice communities. The second part I think that is going to be really um, positive as we move forward is um, the White House in, um, Environmental Justice Interagency Council, which will be composed in, in, and it's a version of the current interagency working group that EPA has been um, holding down. Um, and the goal of that, again, is going to be make sure that environmental justice is embedded in every single agency. And as you know, one of the campaign promises and administration promises of, of President Biden has been to invest 40% of investment benefits toward disadvantaged or to vulnerable communities in the area of clean energy, affordable housing, transportation, uh, pollution reduction, et cetera. And so that is no small feat. How do we get 40% of trillions of dollars to um, uh, disadvantaged and vulnerable communities is going to be the major task. And that includes a number of things, making sure that we identify which are the most vulnerable and priority communities for those investments. How do we make sure that those investments are getting to the people that need them most? How do we monitor and evaluate to make sure that agencies are performing in the best possible and effect, most effective way to meet the needs of our vulnerable communities? And how can we expand on where we are now and make sure that as we move into the future, our communities are um, invested in and that they have a say in how those investments will happen. So I, I am really excited about playing this role in helping to facilitate all of that happening. And of course, it takes a community. It takes all of our communities in the EJ world and it takes a community inside government to make sure that we make this happen and working together to make it happen. And so Cecilia, I'm not gonna let you get away with not taking some some, some credit, okay? Um, I mean, wow, yes, it takes a village. All of us are working on these issues together. Your role, your voice, um, I celebrate you. It's been a real pleasure to have this conversation with you. Uh, I honor you for, um, for all that you've done and all that I know you will do to make that vision you described a, a true reality. And uh, I'm looking forward to reading the history books and perhaps both our grandchildren will uh, <laughs> be able to open a book or however they'll do it by the time they get to the level of um, uh, just kind of looking back over decades, right? <laughs> Who knows, there would be something very, very brand new about that. But that they will see your name and they will see the names of other 
women leaders who took full advantage of this moment in time. So congratulations again for the awesome role that you've been selected to play. It's not by accident, it's because you bring so much to this moment. And um, I'm looking forward to all the work that's gonna come out of that. Thank you so much, Danelle. It is just an honor to be with you and to be in this movement together, just um, with much gratitude for all that you've done <laughs> and all that you still will do. <laughs> I'm with you. <laughs> so it's, I don't want to prematurely end if there are any final thoughts or comments you'd like to make. Um, I want you to have the last word. All right. Oh, this has been wonderful. And it's just been wonderful to be able to talk with you, especially because, you know, again, we've been doing this. This is part, part of, of the struggle. And it's, um, yeah, it's it's just an honor to be with you today. And likewise, my sister, likewise. <laughs> Thank you. And that concludes our interview. So Micah, let's Wow. That was so good. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Martinez and Ms. Wilkins for that important and powerful conversation about environmental justice and how they are working towards equality and justice in every breath. To hear more of this conversation, please join us on March 24th at 6 p.m. And now for our final conversation this evening, I have the distinct pleasure of introducing U.S. Senator Debbie Stabenow the senior senator from Michigan. The senator is one of the greatest champions for protecting our environment and fighting the climate crisis. As a member of the Environment and Public Works Committee and a senior member of the Budget Committee and Finance Committees, Senator Stabenow is a leading voice in the Congress on policies to address air pollution. She has championed legislation to enable more consumers to purchase zero emission vehicles, funding for critically important public health programs, and in efforts to ensure clean, affordable drinking water for all communities. Senator Stabenow is the co-chair of the U.S. Senate Bipartisan Great Lakes Task Force and the author of the Great Lakes Restoration Initiative. Under her leadership, the Great Lakes Restoration Initiative Act was signed into law earlier this year. It reauthorized the program and increases funding for over five years. Senator Stabenow serves as the chairwoman of the U.S. Senate Committee on Agriculture, Nutrition, and Forestry. In the 2018 Farm Bill, she authorized the most advanced climate smart agricultural policies to date. Building on that progress, she's leading the effort to help agriculture be part of the solution to the climate crisis. She's partnered with Senator Mike Brown of Indiana to introduce this bipartisan Growing Climate Solutions Act which helps farmers and foresters scale up sustainable practices and tap into new economic opportunities through voluntary carbon markets. Thank you so much for joining us, Senator. We're so pleased to have you and welcome you to our Women in Leadership Climate Summit. Senator Stabenow, we are delighted that you could spend time with us today. Thank you for all the work you are doing in the Senate to protect America's kids. I have a couple of questions for you today, but before we get started, I wanted to give you the opportunity to speak about your priorities and your thoughts on addressing the climate crisis to protect the health and the future of our children. Well, it's wonderful to be with you today. And thank you, thank you, thank you for what all of you are doing. Um, it, the reality is that the climate crisis is the greatest threat to our way of life and to our children and our families both in Michigan and the country and around the world. And that's really something to say when we've been through this last year, right, on the pandemic. But as horrible as the pandemic is, um, right, right in front of us is this huge thing uh, called climate change or the climate crisis, as I call it. Um, in Michigan, a lot of bells and whistles went off for me a couple of years ago when the University of Michigan did a report that showed that the Great Lakes were actually warming faster than the oceans and what that means for us. And uh, if so when we look at the fact that uh, Lake Superior is getting about two, two degrees warmer 
each decade. It's the one of the top five uh, most the fastest warming lakes in the world right now. And what we are seeing for our families and communities and uh, the Great Lakes all around us. We all know about the volatile weather constantly. We see what's happening in Texas. We see what's happening um, all over the country and the destruction and so on. But in Michigan, when I think of as someone who's lived in Michigan my whole life, we see the erratic levels in the Great Lakes which are threatening our homes and communities, all the erosion uh, and the chaos connected to that and the health challenges. I did a report on all of the different ways that the warming is affecting us in Michigan from disease carrying insects, including ticks and mosquitoes, uh, more smog and longer allergy seasons. So a whole range of things that are affecting us that people may or may not tie back to the climate crisis, but I know you do. And that's why I'm so grateful for all that you're doing. Let me just also say, I'm very, very grateful to this new president and vice president. I have to tell you, it's so wonderful to have people that say the words climate change out loud and who understand the incredible sense of urgency that we all must have going forward uh, it, in, in the future and not like distant future. I'm talking about now, tomorrow, the next day, the next day, the next day, what we need to be working together. And they understand that just like COVID is, we, ha we have to deal with science. Uh, climate change is all about science. It's not politics. It's all about science. And so I'm, I'm just grateful to be here with you and have the opportunity to talk about the various ways that I'm involved in this issue, as well as, I have to say, a whole range of things for children. This COVID package that just passed, I'm so proud to have negotiated the nutrition and food assistance provisions in here for children that have not been able to eat in school, uh, need help in the summer, as well as their parents and seniors and others. The child tax credit that was gonna, that's gonna basically eliminate half of child poverty this year. Um, healthcare, uh, behavioral health, I mean, all of the ways in which we have to lift up our children, make sure that moms, that, 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 that uh, women that are pregnant have the quality care that they need and that uh, health care is available for pregnant moms and babies and that the WIC program is available for nutrition, on and on and on. And so I just want to thank you for all that you are doing and uh, look forward to your questions. Well, leading into that, as chair of the Agricultural Committee and member of the Finance, Environment, and Public Works and Budget Committees, you are uniquely positioned to play a major role in addressing the climate crisis. Can you discuss your priorities and those of the Democratic Caucus this year? Absolutely. You know, I find myself, as you said, in a very unique situation, a senior member on Finance Committee where all the clean energy tax incentives are coming forward. The, uh, the uh, consumer tax credit to help more people be able to purchase electric vehicles. We have about 2% of the public purchasing electric vehicles now. We need about 10% in order to be able to drive the price down to a more affordable place. Uh, so consumer credits are important. Clean energy manufacturing tax credits that I'm leading on to make sure all those great component parts are made in Michigan, made in America. Uh, whether it's electric vehicles, whether it's the 8,000 parts in a big wind turbine, 8,000 parts, we can make every one of them in the United States. We can make every one of them in Michigan. So a clean energy manufacturing tax credit that I have that uh, will facilitate that as well. So a lot of things around on the financing end that I'm doing in uh, the finance committee, in environment and public works committee, on what, which I said, we are leading the effort in inviting uh, writing a new infrastructure bill. And part of that new infrastructure is charging stations for electric vehicles. We need to make sure that these great new vehicles that are being made, and they are awesome, uh, are, are ones that you feel comfortable that you can drive across the country, uh, drive uh, you know across the state. Uh, and that means having uh, fast, uh, charging stations available everywhere, as well as uh, other kinds of support available. And then with my agriculture hat on, 
I'm leading uh, in the space that we call bio, uh, biodiversity or land-based solutions, which are very, very important as it relates to keeping carbon out of the air and keeping it in the ground. You know, one of the, the best things you can do is plant a tree and it's gonna soak up a lot of carbon and hold that carbon in the tree um, as long as um, the tree is living. And uh, we know that it, our farmers want a lot of carbon in the soil because it's better for crops. And so the more we can do around conservation, around soil health, around a whole range of things that deal with carbon sequestration, carbon in the soil where we want it, not in the air, not in the atmosphere. It's better for everyone. And so I'm leading a bipartisan effort called Growing Climate Solutions Act. We did a hearing on it uh, just uh, a week ago in the Agriculture Committee talking about what, how agriculture and forestry can lead in a, in a way on climate solutions. We're gonna be moving forward to get the US Department of Agriculture aggressively involved working with growers to create both a, a carbon market for them to be able to benefit from uh, carbon solutions that sequester carbon, but also methane, nitrogen oxide, very dangerous uh, uh, greenhouse gases as well, and uh, having solutions that are zero emission that we can do. And folks in agriculture and forestry are ready to do it. They want to do it. I've been able to build a bipartisan group to move forward on that, both for forestry and agriculture. So this is going to be very, very significant um, as, as part of the way we lead and show that you can create new revenue sources, you can create new jobs by doing the right thing, protecting our children, protecting our families and communities. Well, thank you, Senator. Moms in Michigan are so grateful for all the work you are doing to address the climate crisis and all the unique ways that you are doing it in the Senate. So we really appreciate all that you are doing for us. And thank you for your time today. Well, my great pleasure. You know, we moms, we're a mighty force when we get engaged. And so let's just keep speaking up for our kids. Uh, they, they need to know that we're going to be speaking up for them so they're healthy and have the opportunities to succeed. So it's wonderful to be with you. Thank you again for your time today. Thank you for all who have joined us today. A special thanks to Senator, our Congresswoman, Dr. Martinez, Donnell, and of course, Director Clark, who have joined us today in this wonderful Women Leadership Summit. Thank you.